All right, for this one, I'm gonna categorize several of these together. Let's say that our metering device, our thick source metering device is too large. Remember our metering device should match our compressor. So a lot of times I'll see people that leave the wrong metering device here and that metering device is too large. Or maybe somebody took one out and it's missing. At the end, I'll cover a story on that. Or maybe I have a thermostatic expansion valve that's stuck open. Somebody abused it when they were installing it. Maybe they didn't have clean lines or maybe they overheated it while brazing it and that TXV stuck open or the sensing bulb that should be mounted in the suction line isn't mounted correctly or somebody took it off. Without it reading a proper amount of superheat, it lets too much refrigerant through. So this is gonna be the scenario of this metering device being too large. Now again, it's not about you memorizing that. It's not about direct science with this. It's about giving you an idea of how the refrigeration cycle is affected by some of these conditions. Remember that metering device should be sized with the compressor. So it's able to build high pressure on one side and have the low pressure on the other side. So if our metering device is letting too much refrigerant flow through, being oversized, missing, stuck open, or installed incorrectly, that's gonna be an issue. So let's take a look at what would happen if this is letting too much go through. If it's letting too much flow through, that means it's essentially kind of draining out of our condensing unit. So what you'll typically see is our subcooled liquid will go down. The liquid literally starts draining out of the condensing unit. So we end up with a starved condensing unit. So I don't have enough subcooled liquid. Liquid. So that's going to be an issue. Now, as we're draining that liquid out of the condensing unit and also the pressure flowing out of the condensing unit. So that means our head pressure now starts to drop. We get a lower amount of head pressure. Because of a lower amount of head pressure, our saturated temperature is also going to drop. That temperature becomes now lower. So as that temperature starts to get lower, our TD, the temperature difference between the refrigerant and the air, also becomes closer together or lower. So that number actually starts to drop. So all of our refrigerant is draining out of our condensing unit. And because we're not able to have a small enough hole here, the pressure on this side drops out. Well, what that pressure does is it ends up over here in the evaporator side. So our evaporator suction pressure ends up going up. We end up with a higher suction pressure. There's more pressure in the evaporator than there should be. But also because the suction pressure goes up, our suction saturated temperature goes up as well. The temperature of the refrigerant boiling goes up. Well, now as the temperature of the refrigerant boiling goes up, it's closer to the air temperature, which means the condenser TD is less than what it should be. So that's gonna be one factor. And also, as we're losing liquid refrigerant out of the condensing unit, where does that liquid end up? Our liquid ends up over here in our evaporator coil. So if we end up with too much liquid in our coil, what does that do to our superheat? Well, let's say if I wanted this much superheated vapor, but I only have this much superheated vapor, that tells us we have an issue. So our superheated vapor ends up being too low. Too little vapor means too much saturated liquid mixture. So it ends up with it being a flooded evaporator. So I got too much liquid refrigerant in my evaporator, it's flooded, and I got a starved condensing unit. It's all drained out of the condensing unit and it flooded into my evaporator coil. On top of that, it's possible to overfill our evaporator coil, get liquid refrigerant back to a compressor, start washing the oil out of the bearings of the compressor, start getting liquid refrigerant on the windings, eating the insulation off the windings, foaming the liquid refrigerant, getting liquid oil and also liquid refrigerant potentially in the valves of the compressor, causing long-term compressor damage. Wow, that's a mouthful of what's happening. All of that because of their metering device. And I've seen this done by accident. Somebody simply changed the evaporator coil or they changed the condensing unit and they left whatever metering device was with the evaporator coil instead of putting the metering device that matched the compressor. And because it made noise and blew cold air, they thought, well, it works. Well, it wasn't working because I had to go out and fix it. I went to another scenario where somebody took the metering device out entirely. They took the metering device entirely out. And I asked the guy, why did you do that? He said, well, the scenario he thought was it would let more liquid in the evaporator. And more liquid means magical more cooling. He didn't say magical, but you get the drift. I also had a brand spanking new unit. I was on call, it was a Friday night. The install crew is working on it. They couldn't get it fixed. They called me, they went home. I came out and I'm checking. I'm seeing all these numbers, but it was the first time that I ever saw that. And I couldn't figure out what was going on, but everything led to this meeting device. And my thought was, well, the meeting device is new. It can't be a problem but I ended up having to take all the refrigerant out of the system and I opened up the metering device to find there was no metering device inside. There was no fixed orifice. Now, usually we use thermostatic expansion valves because they work so much better, but in this case, there wasn't either one in there. So I called back to the lead installer and also the, his assistant. We found out what happened was every time they did an install, they would always take out that fixed orifice metering device and install a TXV. 
Well, the assistant at that time didn't know why. He just knew that every single coil, we take it apart, take this little piece, throw it away, and put this other piece in place. Well, that particular day, they didn't have the TXV. It was on back order for whatever reason. So the guy still did his job. He's like, well, I don't know why, but we always take this and throw it away. And so he took it and threw it away. And he said, to go ahead and put it back together, we don't, we don't have the TXV. So he put it back together with that fixed opus not being there. And so I had to drive all the way back to the shop, go through the big skid dumpster, look for the model number of the condensing unit so I could find out what box was there, dig through all the trash and find that fixed opus meter device. Soak it in alcohol while I drove all the way back out to this call, put it back in, change the filter dryer, pressure tested, pull the vacuum and recharge it with refrigerator and the system was running absolutely fantastic. So as you can see how these little simple scenarios happen. But also with the thermostatic expansion valve, these valves are abused. Let's say somebody braised the system without running nitrogen through. Well, the new oil, the PLE oil, cleans all that oxidation off of the lines. It didn't do that with mineral oil before, but now all that oxidation is floating with the oil. And that oxidation will then collect in the thermostatic expansion valve, causing it to stick, maybe stick open or stick closed. Another scenario would be when they braised that TXV in, they overheated it when they braised it. They caused that rod in there to be damaged or stick. Or maybe they braised the suction without taking the sensing bulb off first. And that overpressure the sensing bulb causing damage to the TXV. Those are issues I've seen. So when a TXV fails, I'm looking to see, is it really the TXV or other conditions? Or how did somebody murder it? How did somebody damage it? And then the final one, as I've seen people take the sensing bulb completely off. They think that if they take the sensing bulb off, it lets more refrigerant and evaporator cool and makes magically better cooling. In reality, it simply floods the evaporator coil, getting liquid refrigerant and starts killing the compressor. So I put the sensing bulb back on the system and then I start diagnosing of what's really happening with the system. But these are all scenarios. All these scenarios will give you the same exact results. But I don't want you to memorize these and there's other factors involved. I want you thinking about how the cause and effect is gonna be working. And if you're thinking about cause and effect, you're able to solve an unlimited amount of problems.